balance sheet is still very, very tight. And we believe that it could get tighter as we go forward. So the fallout of recent days has become a buying opportunity uh, for those that monitor this closely. Uh, meanwhile, corn sags some more uh, just under the weight of its larger balance sheet and some of its own natural pressure here, uh, dropping two cents. We don't really have a whole lot of uh, harvest data that's out there in any big form, but some of the early yields that have been coming out have suggested that while this crop may not be uh, a record, it's still fairly solid and uh, probably bodes well to support some of the yield numbers that were brought forward in uh, the report on Tuesday. Yeah, I look at first for this report. It's very disappointed for corn. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. You know, there there was a lot of expectations, especially with some of the drought conditions that we saw for, you know, a, a little bit more of a, a bullish uptick, if you could, you know, that maybe that dry conditions would really push yield lower and we could see maybe a 2012 again. Sure. And I think what we got instead was 2013 uh, and we continue to see uh, the crop outperform expectations. Yeah. All right, good. How is demand for the beans complex to China? We are seeing a shipping confirmation to them. Could you explain that to the audience? Yeah, that would be correct. So we are seeing some export sale announcements to China. Any sale announcement that's over 100,000 metric tons, uh, FSA at USDA, or excuse me, FAS at USDA has to uh, put out an export announcement. And so, you know, we're seeing these US, U.S. soybean export sales overall come out, but we're also lagging significantly behind how many export sales we've had to this point compared to last year. And so I do think that's a little bit to the reason for cutting exports in the WASD this past week, as opposed to crush. And so we're, and really we're, we see that we're nearing the bare minimum qu quantity of soybeans demanded by that expanding crush capacity. And you can't really cut much more. And so uh, the more obvious take is, Yes, we've seen the export sales to China. They're coming in in large amounts, but we're lagging behind last year. And so uh, it's an easier change to do that than, say, the crush side. Yeah, and, and, that, and, and, and Shelby brings up some great points. This will continue to be something we watch really closely over the next 60 <laughs> to 90 days, because if you've been monitoring the river levels, um, we continue to challenge the ability of um, river going cargo to, to, to run at full capacity. Uh, water levels are lower and so you can't fill the barges full. That has had a, an impact on basis levels and could very much have an impact on how much product we can actually move south in the river system to be able to accommodate some of these exports. So be watching that, Caesar, as we go forward in the in the months to come.
Yes. On the Mississippi is lower again. So, Mike, I actually just wrote an article about this and talked about why we really cared. Caesar, I'd love to share it with you. Um, you know, we kind of had the repercussions of a low river level last fall. And I think that's a great indication of some lessons learned, but also we know what the impact can be. And I think maybe this is one of the more predictable times for commodities to say, this is going to be lower. Uh, and here's what to expect. I think Mike touched on it a little bit. We're going to have to lighten the loads of the barges, which means we'll have fewer barge barges able to travel through with enough grain to keep it going. Uh, and this is difficult at a peak time when we're harvesting a whole lot of well, river handles about 60% of U.S. soybean and corn exports. So you really have this situation where the barges are going to have to take more trips with lighter loads. You're going to see freight rates increase. We talked about bases uh, and that slowdown of grain flow from the north to the exports uh, could really be a problem for a lot of the global export destinations that, frankly, the corn balance sheet could really use. Uh, this is a time when prices are at seasonal lows because we're harvesting a lot of supply. Demand is really high. And this is not a great time for U.S. exports to look less attractive, but this is exactly what could happen if the barge levels continue to go lower. Uh, I have to wonder, too, if the lower Mississippi River levels last fall contributed to our lower corn exports in the 2022-23 marketing years. And this means we could be in store for that again. I will ask you guys that what we have to see the commodity prices are continuing on its down for the futures. What do you recommend for the farmers and headers about the corn complex? Well, your question uh, is a little bit of a loaded one, Caesar. Really? The reality of a falling market is such that no one who's selling grain uh, puts much of a smile on their face. Really? They, they, they are not excited about a falling market, but that is the reality of a market. And as we draw closer to harvest, this is something that's a very expected seasonal uh, condition. So, you know, when when we observe that corn prices have been moving lower, and, and, and more specifically, as we talk about the new crop corn market, we, we peaked out back in uh, mid-June, the market broke, found a little bit of a rally off, off of some, you know, hot and dry conditions that were coming at us, uh, found another peak about 570 and change in late July, and has been in a slow decline with a slightly sideways type of um, motion to it here in the last month. But these are normal uh, conditions of a market as we head towards harvest. And, and really at this point, uh, because we're moving towards harvest, traders and hedgers need to be looking at the, at the big picture and the whole complex. And one of the things that we've really spent a lot of time on uh, with our clients over the course of the last month or so is to observe the carry opportunity that lays forward in the calendar. And if you look at carry, carry is simply the difference between the price at harvest and any other month than in the future. And right now the March, uh, the, the December to March carry is about 14 cents. Mm. Now, relative to the last few years, that's a very wide carry which is partly inspired by the higher interest rates, but also a, a function of the bigger crop that's due this fall relative to the demand that Shelby was just outlining. That bigger ending stocks number is causing buyers to maybe be a little bit more standoffish and offer a greater reward for you to bring it to them later rather than all at harvest. And so that is an opportunity to be looking at in corn. Soybeans have a different story. They do have 
some degree of carry, but relatively speaking, not as much of one. And as we contemplate some of these sales decisions relative to available storage on farm, and as we look at the price opportunity, uh, what we're likely to see is a lot of soybeans show up for sale at the buyer's doorstep this fall. And that's a place, given that tight balance sheet that we talked about, for different producers to be considering call option strategies. Because if, in fact, the balance sheet re remains tight, and we believe it will, um, there is a good possibility that that fall sale may be greeted with further future opportunity. And that's really hard to fully grasp right now because the other part that we haven't talked about is a South America crop that we expect to be record large uh, in Brazil specifically, but then significantly larger in Argentina uh, as we compare them to prior year's con uh, conditions where they, by way of drought, suffered and had far fewer, fewer volumes to make available to the world market. So there's a lot to consider right now, but as, as we talk about that corn and soybean complex, there are definitely some considerations to be uh, looking at. Very good point about the commodity markets for right now because we were very dry. Well, indeed, and the dry weather has not gone unnoticed in this marketplace, um, but I would say at this point in time, that particular story, that particular headline starts to lose a little bit of its, 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 its uh, weight, if you will, because we're in the midst of the first uh, part of harvest and as you start moving into harvest, you begin to forget about weather unless it's too much rain and you can't harvest. Mm -hmm. uh, but the dryness uh, and and the effect that it's had on yield has 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 been registered. But now that we've shifted into harvest, it becomes less of a story, and we kind of put it behind us in lieu of talking about the yield results that are coming out of the field. Shelby, how much does corn demand for this year's harvest season? It's roll on. Yeah, I corn demand just cannot get mm -hmm. the love that it needs. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think Mike touched on some really good points about where we see the markets today. And, you know, as an economist, I'm looking at the bigger picture and you kind of look at some of these stocks to use ratios and think there's no way that the corn price should be this high. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> so I, I also <throat> caution producers, take care of your now because long-term, this has got to bottom out somewhere and mm. the balance sheet can afford the supply cuts that we had this week and frankly could go even lower. You know, we did an analysis that for the corn balance sheet to even turn bullish, given the demand expectations that WASD has out there for right now, that corn yield really has to fall below 165 bushels per acre to really see any movement on ending stocks that would turn the corn price back to being bullish. Um, you look at years that we've had similar stocks to use ratio at these levels, and frankly, the corn price should be well below $4, closer to that 370 mm -hmm. range. I think at one point, it, mm -hmm. the average farm price was $3.36 a bushel. And that's the way that some of this demand picture looks. So you know, I want to stay optimistic and say, you know, maybe there's a way for our price to come down enough that we're more attractive to global purchasers. And that's where we see the export pickup. Uh, but I also don't want to give false hope. And you, I think farmers have to understand there's a little bit of built in price inflation to the corn balance sheet right now that we're getting a bump from macroeconomic inflation in here uh, that we kind of have to quarter and moved into the fourth quarter. Uh, to buy up commodities. And it really, it wasn't a corn or a soybean play. It was a commodity play. They bought everything. 
And now that we've seen the Fed move in with a higher interest rate, that force, that interest in the market has also exited and gone the other direction as well. So, you know, when you remove the big exports of that time and you remove a lot of the speculative money of that time and, you know, you, you start to normalize this market, it's when we start to, you know, look at prices like the ones we have. And, you know, as we've uh, alluded to a couple of times now, possibly even lower. Now, how is in the livestock market for today and hog markets? Well, um, let, let's 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 start with the hog market. Uh, it largely has been caught in a bit of what I'll call a sideways range, really for the last couple of months. And if you look at this week's market, uh, we started this week's market higher, ran it up into yesterday's trade. We finished lower. Uh, you know, we continued that again today. So for the week, we're still up, but uh, the market was a little bit softer, finishing down. Uh, about uh, a penny and a quarter or a buck and a quarter, if you refer to it on the 100 weight. Uh, cattle, on the other hand, uh, was up about two and a half cents or 250 on the 100 weight. Um, you know, that's a very, very strong market. Now, in both of those, we've seen cutout values start to soften a little bit. And this doesn't come as a big shocker now that we're on the other side of Labor Day. We've officially put the grilling season behind us. We have, you know, people, um, you know, getting back into what we'll call school schedules and starting to, you know, change the way their household uh, interacts outside of the home. Um, bottom line is we have some real concerns about how that's going to look uh, as we go forward. There has been a uh, ongoing interest in dining out, and if you look at some of the CPI numbers that came out this week, uh, we did see um, ongoing uh, elevation in prices, uh, mostly inspired by uh, energy and, and what the fuel complex has done over the course of the last 60 days. But as that's translated back into consumer response, uh, grocery store sales are only slightly lower, but food service continues to be able to notch its way back higher, and people are continuing to spend money there. And so we're hopeful that, you know, much like you'll see reported in other news channels this week, that the resilient consumer uh, can continue uh, keeping this thing alive. But um, we do have some real concerns in the protein sectors. Uh, as we get into this time of the year uh, for uh, some downside pressure there as well. But let's not lose sight of what we have. We have a cattle market that's at all-time record highs. Mm -hmm. So we can't get too upset about that or very down in the mouth about that opportunity. Meanwhile, hogs are struggling a little bit, but we've continued to see sows moved out of uh, the breeding herd, we expect to start seeing smaller herd numbers, tightening things up a little bit there, and then hopefully uh, presenting that as a, a uh, you know, a great substitute for some of the beef that's at all-time record highs. Shelby, what is your opinion on the economy and reflect on these cattle markets for the future? Really quick response for the audience. Sure. So USDA forecasts that 2023 net farm income to be similar to 2021, mostly on the expectations we're going to see declining prices and elevated production costs. We see nearly every agriculture commodity forecast a decrease in cash receipts, except cattle. And the beef cattle inventory is at record low, uh, primarily due to high input costs and drought closer to the end of last year that forced farmers to reduce their herds. So that low supply is driving these prices higher. And the wild card factor, I think Mike touched on this a little bit, is maintaining beef demand as, in, as inflation persists. And it all comes back together as we're watching you know, the consumer price inflation, we're watching retail sales, we're watching restaurant sales, you know, maintaining that beef demand will be key to helping these prices stay where they're at in the cattle uh, markets.
Finally, what is your opinion on the weather models in Central U.S. and the Corn Belt? Well, after three straight La Ninas, we have expected expectations that we've entered this El Nino weather pattern period. And that mm -hmm. tends to bring drier than normal conditions from now through the fall, but then transition to a wetter and cooler conditions late fall and into winter. So, uh, you know, we expect dry enough to harvest, but then it could get really wet, really cold, really fast. But then the also thing thing to remember about El Nino is that it's incredibly unpredictable weather pattern. So it really depends on the strength of El Nino and whether or not any of that becomes true. Is there anything would you like some more advice for these markets and head funds for the farmers for right now, Mike? Well, I guess I would just build on what I had touched on earlier. Make sure that you're not looking at the current prices as something that's absolutely terrible. I think we can all agree that the price relative to this year's cost of production is much more compressed maybe even in red ink. But I think as you look at the bigger picture, uh, and we've, we've outlined that uh, today, there is a lot more risk to the downside. And so you need to be dotting every I, crossing every T, be monitoring carry, be monitoring basis, give price a fair evaluation of where it is relative to what fair value could be. And then start mapping out how you're going to clean up the bushels that are still unpriced or untouched this year that are very quickly going to be coming out of the field. And then also be looking at 2024, because if you look at the 2024 opportunity right now with some of the uh, you know beliefs that we have regarding cost of production, that $5 corn market that's being made available to us in 2024 starts to become pretty attractive. Likewise, if you look at 2024 soybeans, we're still trading that at $13. And while it's at a discount to the current market, just like we saw with corn last year, if we can maintain uh, the balance sheet we have, and more importantly, if South America gets this really big record crop, we could be back to having some of these same conversations and then looking at $13 going, boy, I wish I would have mm. made a sale there. So start mm -hmm. talking 2024 inside of, you know, your management group, be looking out into the future because, you know, I think Shelby pointed it out 2020 was the beginning of the rally and you couldn't hardly do anything wrong as the market kept marching higher. And it had a lot of different reasons as to why it was able to contain it or continue that run upward. We're on the flip side of that now, which is very ordinary in agricultural markets. I'll say this. If you look at your career in farming and recognize the periods when you've had really great years, it's not often when you've had two or three back to back. We've just come through that. And generally speaking, on the other side of that is a rebalancing where we move back to much tighter margins, perhaps inverted margins. And I think that's the mindset that we need to be carrying as we go forward. It's a much more defensive posture than an offensive one like we saw in that 2020 to 2022, to early 23 type of marketplace. For sure. Thanks for coming along with us for this afternoon, you guys. Welcome to the show anytime. Oh, thank you so much for having us. It was a blast. Absolutely. Pleasure to join you, Caesar. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.